Is it a sin to be angry? We'll see what the Bible says next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with evangelist Kevin Presley. Just about all of us become angry from time to time. And for some, it takes a lot to make them angry. And then some of us, well, we have a very short fuse. In fact, we've all encountered someone with a volatile temper. One time I worked with a man who had that kind of explosive temper. And one day he was sitting at a table behind the building where we worked, enjoying his break and reading the newspaper. And all of a sudden, a little breeze came up and blew his newspaper off the table and scattered it in the grass. Well, the man blew up. Uh, he stood up and fired off a few expletives. And then, would you believe, he even shook his fist at the sky and cursed the wind. Sometimes little things annoy us, and through the course of a day, they add up until we finally boil over. And then there are times in relationships where we might harbor ill feelings over something. Maybe it even happened a long time ago, but we don't say very much about it. We keep it to ourselves. but inside we're bitter. And that bitterness is like a pile of smoldering rags until something feeds just the right amount of oxygen to it and boom, it ignites in an outburst of anger. Anger is very hard to control. But it raises the question, is it a sin? I think most would agree that some degrees of anger are wrong. But then some would say that a Christian is never to be angry. In fact, some will say that the image of a Christian is someone who never becomes upset, is always agreeable and even timid and mild. But what say of the Scriptures? The Bible actually has a good bit to say about emotions like anger. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32, the wise King Solomon said, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Well, what does it mean to be slow to anger and to rule our spirit? Does that mean that anger under all circumstances is a sin? Would you believe that there are some things that a Christian actually should be angry about? We'll turn to the Word of God for insight in a moment. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word, and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Is it a sin to become angry? I think we would agree that anger in most cases is unbecoming of a Christian. It's hard to imagine somebody reflecting the life and love of Christ who goes through life with an explosive temper and uh, always angry at someone or over the things around him. In fact, many times anger is a manifestation of bitterness. And when you see someone who is chronically angry, well, many times it's the result of unresolved issues in their life. 
And sometimes the source of it goes back years and years. Sometimes people have been abused and severely hurt and uh, they react defensively with anger. Their anger is a way of fending off further attack or uh, seeking attention or vindicating themselves in the mistreatment that they have suffered. Or some think that a hot temper, a sharp tongue, a brutish display of power makes them appear less vulnerable and makes them look strong to others. Well, Solomon says it's the very opposite. The wise man said in Proverbs 16 and verse 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Now our spirit in this case refers to our temperament and our emotions. And Solomon is saying that the greatest battle that we must fight is actually the battle to conquer ourselves, not someone else. Now, it's human to experience emotions like anger, but the Bible is telling us that we must be in control of our spirit. We must learn to rule our emotions, not be ruled by them. But notice Solomon does not say that it is a sin to become angry. He says the man who rules his spirit is rather slow to anger. In other words, it doesn't overcome him. He doesn't have knee-jerk reactions to things that agitate him and fly off the handle and lose control of his emotions. When, when he becomes angry, there's a reason for it, and he controls the anger. It does not control him. Now the fact is the Bible does teach that not only are there times when anger is permissible, there are times when it is absolutely appropriate. But we have to be careful that our anger is properly motivated, properly channeled, and controlled. Now, when does it ever become appropriate for the Christian to become angry? Well, we of course read where Jesus was angry on at least two occasions. At least I don't know how one could interpret the actions of Jesus in any other way but to say that the Son of God was angry. Uh, twice Jesus cleansed the temple, once toward the beginning of His ministry and once at the very end. The first time was in John chapter 2. And uh, beginning in verse 13, it tells us that at the Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when He had made a scourge of small cords, a whip in other words, He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changer's money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remember that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And then in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus goes to the temple again, and he cleanses it a second time, this during the final week. And he goes into the temple turning over the money changers' tables and saying in verse 13 of Matthew 21, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, now what was this all about? Well, the temple here was under the rule of Annas the high priest and Annas' sons. Now, they had set up a lucrative business at the temple called the Temple Market. It was a bazaar of sorts where they sold items particularly that were needed for the sacrifices that took place there. Well, that doesn't sound so bad because most temple goers were pilgrims who traveled a great distance to worship at the temple and therefore it was a hardship for them to bring the animals and other supplies that were needed for their sacrifices. And so Annas and his family had this market set up in the outer court of the Gentiles where people could come and uh, buy what they needed to worship. Uh, they made sure that the animals met all of the requirements, and so uh, uh, this was very convenient. You could argue that it was even a benevolent and helpful thing to the people to have this service available. But I don't think that was the problem. The problem was the same one that you have when you go to the airport. And uh, you decide after you get all checked in that you want something to eat. Well, you're stuck and you don't have much of a choice if you want a meal and so they can charge you a lot more. Well, Jesus showed that the concern of the, of the high priest, of these temple officials, wasn't really to help the people, but rather to entrap them. It wasn't to help the common man, it was to help themselves. They had a racket going 
And they were taking advantage of these pilgrim worshipers, charging exorbitant amounts of money to obtain what they had to have to offer a sacrifice. Uh, in fact, the doves that they were selling were primarily sacrifices that the poor could offer. And so these men were taking advantage of these uh, indigent worshipers. Well, Jesus was incensed. And He didn't quietly slip in and ask to see the high priest and uh, tactfully ask him to consider perhaps what he was doing. Oh no, Jesus marched into the temple court. He started throwing tables over. He started shooing those unscrupulous men out of the temple. And when the Lord was finished, you had animals running and flying loose, the temple a mess, money all over the floor. Now, did Jesus lose control of His Spirit? Did Jesus sin? Well, of course not, because the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 that Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. Normally, if a person went into a place like that and uh, behaved as Jesus did, we might think, well, how terrible, how out of line. But not Jesus, and not in this case. Why? Well, first of all, remember, Jesus deliberately went into the temple to cleanse it. This wasn't a matter that Jesus just stumbled upon the temple and sees these money changers there and has a flash of temper and loses control. No, Jesus intentionally went to the temple knowing, the all-knowing Son of God went to the temple knowing what He would see there, and He went to cleanse it. In fact, He was fulfilling a divine prophecy, and I'll show you how in just a second. And at least in one sense, he was fulfilling the picture that uh, Malachi painted of him back in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3, that the Christ would come as a refiner and purify the priests and the temple. At the very least, what Jesus did here, literally, on these two occasions, was a picture of what he came to do spiritually. So there was a divine overarching purpose involved when Jesus showed this great anger over what was happening in the temple. Now, here's the prophecy that the disciples recognized Jesus as fulfilling when He did that. John, in John 2, tells us that after Jesus cleansed the temple the first time, that the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. John chapter 2 and verse 17. He went to the temple, in other words, with righteous indignation over how these religious leaders, who should have known better, were showing such disrespect to the house of His Father in heaven. You see, Jesus was motivated not out of spite, not out of vindictiveness over some personal wrong, but rather this was a show of righteous indignation. Now there are times and there are things that warrant a certain form of anger. Anger that is rightly motivated, rightly directed, and carefully controlled. Friend, anybody who cares about righteousness and who loves the Lord and loves the Word of the Lord ought to be angry about what we see around us. We ought to be angry over the disrespect and blasphemy that people direct toward our precious Lord. We ought to be angry when we see the weak and the poor and the vulnerable abused and taken advantage of. It ought to make us angry when we see children molested and abused. We ought to be angry over the sewer of filth and vulgarity that Hollywood has unleashed in our living rooms. These things ought to make us angry, just like Jesus was angry. But Jesus didn't lose control of His anger. He didn't abuse or mistreat those people, but He let it be known in no uncertain terms that He was angry over their sin. But now, let me caution you with this. That anger needs to be tempered by sorrow and love. Listen, just before this, when Jesus was making His way into Jerusalem for this final week, the Bible tells us how Jesus stopped atop the Mount of Olives. He had a spectacular view of the entire city of Jerusalem. And He could look down and He saw that city with its glittering temple and knowing what it had become. It was beautiful on the outside, but it had become rotten inside because of the behavior of God's people. And knowing the judgment that was coming for all of that, the Bible says that this same Jesus who would go into that temple in anger and drive out those money changers, rather on this occasion the Bible says Jesus broke down and wept. He literally sobbed as He looked out over Jerusalem. So Jesus' anger was a righteous anger, 
and it was actually tempered by a broken and concerned heart. Now, I don't mind telling you that the sin of our age makes me angry, but it also makes me very sad when I think about the masses of human souls who are stumbling into hell every day. So there is a righteous kind of anger, but I want you to notice, Jesus may have been angered by seeing the poor exploited. He may have been angry over seeing His Father's temple being turned into a den of thieves, but we never once read where Jesus became angry at somebody for how they treated Him. Isn't that interesting? In fact, isn't that amazing? We don't read where Jesus lashed out at Judas for betraying Him for money. Uh, if anybody ever had a reason to be angry with somebody, but we don't read where Jesus was angry with Judas. Uh, Jesus did not lash out in anger at Peter when He listened to him deny him. I, I mean, if anybody ever had a right to be angry, here's Jesus going through the greatest injustice and impending agonies of His life. It is His darkest hour. And Peter, his closest of disciples, turns his back and denies that he even knows him. Jesus didn't get angry so far as we read. In fact, he forgave Peter. He didn't lash out at Pilate. He didn't retaliate and lash out at the Roman soldiers when they took his garment, when they crowned him with thorns, when they spit on him, mocked him, crucified him. He didn't look down and curse, sad, and threaten the hissing, howling mob of instigators who were hurling insults at Him on the cross. You see the difference? Jesus Himself endured mistreatment. Jesus endured and suffered abuse. And He taught us in word and by example that we are to do the same. And that's very hard. But Solomon said that the strongest man is not the man who takes and conquers a city. The strongest man is he who conquers himself by ruling his own spirit. But now anger can get us in a lot of trouble. And we have to be very, very careful about it. If we don't rule our spirit, anger can get us in a heap of trouble. I recall, for example, Moses. And God had told Moses that to provide water for the people of uh, Israel as they traveled through the wilderness, that if he would speak to the rock, that it would pour forth water so the people could drink. And these people, as they journeyed through the wilderness, were grumbling and they were complaining. Uh, they were making life very miserable for Moses. They were blaming Moses for their plight out here in the wilderness. And, and you can understand, Moses gets angry. I mean, wouldn't you get angry if you were leading this uh, ingrateful mob of people through this barren wilderness? suffering all of this difficulty and all they can do is blame you and hurl insult at you and make your life miserable? Well, Moses had enough of it. And Moses boiled over with anger, but his anger led him to disobey God. His anger led him to instead of speak to the rock, as God said, he took his staff and he struck the rock and he said, must we fetch water for you rebels? Numbers chapter 20 tells us that story. Moses was obviously visibly angry. He was angry at the people, so much so that he disobeyed the Lord, and it got him into trouble. So how do we deal with unholy anger? Listen, anytime we become angry, we need to beware. We need to stop and examine the situation and examine our heart. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 26, the Apostle Paul said, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Be angry, he says, and sin not. Well, that tells me that you can be angry without sinning. But beware, because anger can easily and quickly become sinful. How? Paul says, When we let the sun go down on our wrath. And what he means is when we let our anger take control, when it gets in the driver's seat, deal with that anger instead. Resolve that anger. If it's a personal wrong, get your emotions under control and approach it with the mind of Christ. Don't hold a grudge. Don't let anger well up and ferment and create 
this slow burn the Bible describes as wrath within you, go and get that problem straightened out. Be eager to rectify that issue. Don't, don't let it ferment and smolder. Get it confessed. Get it confronted. Resolve it in your own mind and do it very quickly. Why? Because when you let the sun go down on your wrath, the devil steps in. Paul says, neither give place to the devil. And that's what unrighteous anger is. It is the devil's door into your heart, your life, your relationships. Sometimes it's the door through which he walks right inside a church and begins to do terrible, terrible damage. Anger is the door that the devil uses to get inside your home so he can try to destroy your marriage, defile and discourage your children, ruin your relationships. Don't give place to the devil. And Paul goes on in verses 31 and 32 to say, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, it's interesting. This is really a progression that Paul describes in these verses. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. What's he talking about? Well, bitterness is what happens whenever something comes along and wounds you. You're hurt by something that somebody said, something, some, uh, something that somebody did. Maybe it's something that you imagine that they did. And they're not aware that they did. But nonetheless, uh, you're wounded in your heart and in your spirit over that. And you know, if you don't quickly deal with that, if you don't quickly find a way to resolve that within your own heart and perhaps even between that person, then it turns to bitterness. And bitterness turns to wrath. And wrath is that slow burn. Wrath is that, uh, it, it's just that steady um, resentment that builds up and that slow burning anger that uh, begins to root itself and manifest itself within our heart. And then Paul says, it turns into anger. And anger, in this case, is talking about that flash of temper, that flash of emotion. And it turns to clamor. And this is the person who becomes combative. This is the person who begins to, uh, this is the person who begins to uh, speak, uh, uh, who begins to speak harshly and raise a ruckus over this thing that he's angry about and that is bothering him. And then he becomes guilty of evil speaking. And that's when he begins to rail against and malign somebody else and their character, maybe out of revenge. And then ultimately it's malice. And malice is that deep-seated hatred that all this turns into in a person's heart. So we have to be very, very careful about anger. We have to be careful about bitterness. That's why the Apostle Paul said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath because if you do, you're going to give place to Satan. And then Paul goes on to say, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Verse 32. Now there's a way to keep anger in check. And that is to take on the mind of the Lord. Paul says Christ is our model in this matter. Christ is our example in how to deal with all of these issues that might arise within our hearts and create bitterness and anger and wrath and all of these things. He said we need to learn to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, and forgive each other just as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now you say, well, I'm well within my rights to be angry. I'm well within my rights because they mistreated me. Uh, I have every right to be angry and to continue to be angry at that person because they crossed me and they really hurt me and they don't deserve my forgiveness. Well now, tell me what human being deserves the forgiveness of God. What person on the face of this earth deserves for God to forgive him. Who of us deserved Jesus Christ to die upon the cross for our sins? We didn't deserve that. Christ Jesus came walking down the starry stairs of heaven and was slain on the cross of Calvary for one reason, 
because of the grace of God, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And friend, if you want to keep anger in check, if you want to learn to rule your spirit, then take on the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ in how you deal with others, approach others, how you deal with situations that arise. Learn to rule your spirit. If you've ever visited an assembly of the Church of Christ, you've seen that it's different. No rock bands, no choirs and praise teams, no theatrical productions. That's because we believe worship is simple but profound and is according to what's revealed in God's Word. When you visit with the Church of Christ, you'll find that everybody simply sings the praise of the Lord together, congregationally. We meet around the Lord's table every Sunday to remember the body and blood of the Lord and His new covenant. We pray together. And none of that pop psychology, but sound teaching from the Word of God. Oh, and one more thing. We won't ask for your money. Members provide for the needs of the local church through a weekly collection. So forget all the hype. Come see the difference and be our honored guest today. Follow Let the Bible Speak on Twitter at LTBSTV. We would like to offer you a free printed transcript of our study today on anger. Is anger a sin? If you'd like to go back and look up the passages that we talked about and re-examine this topic, we'll mail the transcript to you as soon as we hear from you. And we'll give you our contact information in just a moment. Also, you can see more about Let the Bible Speak at our website, letthebiblespeak.tv. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to us on YouTube. That's our time today for Let the Bible Speak. We're glad that you've been with us. We hope you'll tell someone else about this program in the days to come. And we hope to meet you back here, the Lord willing, next time for another study from God's Word. Until then, have a great week, and may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.